Good. Call the meeting back to order. Back to order. Representative McDonald, you are before us. Representative McDonald moves that House File 1148 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS omnibus bill. We have the bill before us. Representative McDonald, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to present my bill, a House File 1148. Uh, if you're familiar with the Olmsted Plan, this is uh, takes from the Olmsted Plan and gives it, uh, puts it into law, allocates some funding to train and educate a group of folks that work with some of the most important people in our society. And I think you'll all agree. Those of our friends who are with me at the table here, some of our friends who are in the disability community. But make no mistake about it, not many of them will, uh, many of them will prove to you and show to you that there's not much they can do that we can't do. Does, you know, does that make sense? So, but what, our, what my bill does is it educates and trains a group of folks throughout the state of Minnesota that helps integrate many of our friends who have uh, some disabilities and helps them integrate into community, to be involved in the community, to be active in the community, to be participants in the community, and to be like all of us, wanted, loved, and uh, very capable of doing the job that they are to do. And I have some friends here with me, Rick and Steve is here. They're gonna say a few words to uh, show you uh, how important our bill is. And I just ask for your indulgence and your attention. I know we have a busy night and a lot of bills and we're coming back from caucuses and dinners and so on and so forth. But uh, I promise we won't be long tonight. We want to share with you just a brief little story of why this bill is a good bill to support. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Kay. Mary Kay is, uh, works, is with the ACT program, the ACT, uh, what do you call it? Advocating Change Together. Yeah, Advocating Change Together group, and she's going to share a little bit with you. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you and welcome to the Great. committee. If you could please introduce yourself for the record and give us your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Mary Kay Kennedy and I'm with Advocating Change Together. With me today is um, Mr. Stephen Peck and Steve is a, is, is a ACT member who has participated in the Olmstead Academy. So I'm going to invite members of the committee to um, review the testimony that I've prepared um, it's in your packet, and then I'm just going to turn it over to Steve, and he can tell you about his experiences with the program. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for giving me this opportunity to speak to you about what the Olmsted Academy means to me. Being part of the committee, excuse me, Academy was an extremely positive experience for me. At the Academy, we talked about the fact that everybody benefits when everyone is included. I believe that with all my heart, and I'm proud to be a part of it. I even created this logo on the shirt that I'm wearing today. It captures the spirit of what the Academy is all about, disability, pride, and power. I am a person with a disability. The problem for me has not really been the disability itself. My problems have come more from how some people treat me. I have suffered discrimination, harassment, and a lot of other things I will not go into right now. I joined the Olmsted Academy to figure out how to work for human rights in my community, excuse me, not only for myself, but I wanted to help other people figure out how to live the lives they want to live as well. That's what we call peer-to-peer -peer supports. The Academy and ACT helped me feel supported and respected, and they helped me see that I am not a problem needed to be fixed. I can work to make society better for everyone, including me. When we applied to be part of the Academy, we needed to commit to doing a project in the community. The project my team is working on is to help some of our peers actually implement their person-centered plans. We want to show that with peer supports, people can get more of what they want out of life. The Olmsted Academy included some pretty cool things, like arranging for us to have dinner with Minnesota leaders. I had dinner with an attorney from the Disability Law Center, Mr. Sean Burke, and I also had dinner previously with Ms. Rebecca Covington of the MNCCD, Minnesota Consortium on Citizens with Disabilities. 
And that was pretty cool to meet them and have dinner with them and, and Mr. Burke's wife, Lindsay. And being a leader means being connected and what the Olmstead Academy is. And the Olmstead Academy is helping me do that. Excuse me. One of the things I remember about the Academy was the opening ceremony. The Honorable Judge Donovan W. Frank, who's a federal judge, led the opening and we all revealed the Olmstead Vision. Reviewed, excuse me, not revealed, sorry. The Olmstead Vision and read it, read it out loud. I meant every word of it when I took the pledge to work together to make integration happen. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Mr. Peck. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to testify on this bill? Seeing none, we'll move to member questions. Are there questions from the members? Seeing no questions, Representative McDonald, any final comments? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I encourage you to include this in your omnibus bill uh, for just a few reasons in my closing, because I wrote some, um, some things down for those of you that describes more particularly what the bill was. We kind of got off on a quick start, so I didn't really, uh, I don't think I articulated it. So what the Olmstead plan does is it requires the state of Minnesota to establish a greater integration and inclusion for people with disabilities. This means that people living with disabilities, learning, working, and participating in a community and integrated in all communities. Uh, this means employment, housing, transportation, and support services, lifelong learning and education, health care, and living and uh, healthy living in community uh, engagement. Uh, Advocating Change Together, which Mary Kay is uh, on, is a nonprofit group. It's a disability acts organization that is run for disability, people with disabilities, by people with disabilities, and, uh, and others. Uh, ACT's program seeks to build the awareness of, and skills of indig individuals with disabilities. So they really are a group that um, particularly funnels their resources and their energies and their knowledge and their wisdom into each individual and finds out what their strengths are and how to uh, kind of exacerbate that maybe, pull it out, mm -hmm. and then integrate them into the community. So it's a, it's a complex um, situation in which allows each person to be active and a participant in their community. So I uh, certainly uh, thank you for giving this a hearing and uh, entertain any questions for a second time for all the committee members that are here. And if not, I'll uh, turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, there is one question, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative McDonald, I'm looking at the bill, and um, the bill calls for, I, as I'm understanding it, a total of $377,000 and uh, for a grant. And um, the purpose is, is the training. And I'm wondering if you have an estimate of how many people would be trained under this bill so that we can kind of get a sense of, you know, how this fits with other bills and uh, what they're asking for money to do. Representative McDonald. Yes, uh, thank you, Representative Liebling. Uh, this, uh, that $377,000 will train folks in the Northwest, the Northeast, Central, and Metro, Southwest, and Southeast Minnesota. So a combination of the whole state. I don't have the specific numbers, but I will recommend and or defer to Mary Kay, who will probably have a more specific number for you. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chair and members of the committee, there are 21 participants that are, were in the first class of the Olmsted Academy. And each of those um, participants came in a group. And those groups go back to the regions that Representative McDonald was just mentioning and implement a disability integration project. Those disability integration projects um, reach many people in the region. So we would estimate that um, through the 21 people that participate, they go back to their community and, and reach um, at least dozens and dozens in each region. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, that's, um, if I'm understanding your answer, that's the 21 in the first class. But the bill is for another class going forward, right? Correct. And so do you have an estimate of how many people might actually be trained in the second class and how many people they might reach? Mm -hmm. Ms. Kennedy. 
Yes, representative members of the committee. It would be using the same model. So class two would also have 21 participants or students and they would each design an action or a community integration project and go back to their home communities and implement those projects. Uh, okay, Mr. Chair. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, for, so we're talking about training 21 people who would then go out and have a further impact. And so the, the funding here is, um, is all going toward the training program. Am I right? Ms. Kennedy. Um, representative members of the committee, yes, the funding here is for to, to sponsor the Olmsted Academy for two years. So there will be 21 participants in class number two, an additional 21 in class number three. Okay, thank you. Any Ms. Other, Mr. Chair. Representative McDonald. Yeah, uh, Representative Liebling, when I was first approached with this uh, idea, I too kind of thought it was um, I questioned the number and the work. My initial goal, if you recall, the Olmsted plan was presented to this committee. And they had a little pie chart and dealing with the disability community. And in that pie chart, it dealt with housing, health care, transportation, and employment. But at the top of the pie chart, the very top, was integration in community. Now, I'm sure that all of you have met and worked with and maybe are friends with or cousins, as I am, with folks with disabilities. And as you will probably agree with me in my statement right now, that when you meet those folks, and you see them in your community, and you see them at school, and church, and civic groups, we get more out of it than they do. They enlighten us. They give us, they give me anyway, and my folks in Delano and Wright County, inspiration. Both moving spiritually, inspirationally, and uh, to have them integrate in the community. So Representative Liebling, how do we get them to be engaged in the community? I think it's easier to find transportation, health care, uh, workforce, employment, transportation, all those. That's a little, that's easier than how do you integrate them into the community? How do you make them participants and, and, uh, and uh, enjoy the community and have the community come out? And this part does that. This educates people, and then from there, these 21 or hopefully more, they go out into the state, into the communities, and to learn, to educate, to implement the plan that the Olmsted plan is. So it's a wonderful program. So thank you for your question. Any uh, Representative Loeffler. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think it's important for us to create meaningful opportunities for people to develop the skills to, to participate and, and advocate and have their needs known, not just in this, but I think it's Representative Hamilton who has the, the quality assurance. Um, Bill and I think we've had a number of things going through I do think the number is aiming low and um, I continue to challenge you to say the metro area has to be broken up I it, it's just too big an area I mean Hennepin County alone which is only one of seven of the metro counties has 47 cities and I don't know how many school districts and um, and it's got a few townships too and so to if any one of us, as experienced as we are as public leaders and in public policy debates, and as comfortable as we are going into any situation, I would not even know how to begin to start any kind of real effort in the metro area. And it's almost like we're setting up our metro representatives to fail when we ask them to say, you're to be the voice of people with every type of disability in this part of the state with 50% of the population and probably, you know, 400 local governments of one stripe or another. And we really do need to have you make this a manageable program in every single corner of the state. And so I challenge you before we get to the final drafting of the bill to come back to us with some ideas about how we can make this really a practical um, experience for everyone no matter what part of the state they come from because I think all of us would find it very intimidating um, to try and deal with that big an area and have someone say think of a project that you can engage your area in um, and I think we need to break it down to something more manageable and yet have equal participation from people in the metro area and, and greater Minnesota. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Representative Waffle. I didn't hear a question in that. No, I'm just telling them that <laughs> by the time we get to the final bill, I'm hoping that this will be in the final bill and that they need to, since they didn't have an amendment here tonight, keep working on some opportunities to, to sharpen it up a little. Thank you, Representative Loeffler. Are there any final questions for Representative McDonald? Seeing none, Representative McDonald, do you want to take a, another shot at your final comments? Yes, I do. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I want to address uh, Representative Liebling because you're you asked those same questions uh, two weeks ago in the fine, uh, the policy committee, and they did not fall on deaf ears. Uh, Miss Kennedy and my friend Rick with the camera over there. Oh, I was talking. Can you take another one? Wait a minute. Smile. <laughs> He's a good shooter. Uh -oh. Anyway, uh, we're working on that. And he has some, we'll see you afterwards, uh, Resident Loeffler, because uh, Rick addressed that tonight. And I said, don't worry, she's not going to ask that question again. <laughs> but he's been, they've been working on how to do what you suggested. So with that, uh, I uh, renew my motion to have uh, 1138 be included, to be included in the omnibus bill. Representative McDonald renews his motion that House File 1148 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS omnibus bill. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails, and House File 1148 is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS omnibus bill. Thank you, Representative McDonald. Thank you, committee members. Uh, next, we have Representative Zerwas with House File 1604. And as he's making his way over to the table, Representative Zerwas moves that House File 1604 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS omnibus bill. We have the bill before us, and there is an author's amendment titled DE3. Representative Zerwas moves the DE3 amendment. Representative Zerwas, to your amendment when you're ready. <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, the D3 amendment incorporates a number of changes uh, from feedback that we've heard as this bill has gone uh, through the process, um, addressing specifically um, where, where the uh, auto-injectors can be obtained from. Um, it uh, addresses the training concerns, um, so that training needs to be obtained every two years, um, and then page two, line 33, um, the new language will permit training to be conducted by statewide groups with expertise in providing training on anaphylaxis and allergies only if the training is under the supervision of a board certified uh, allergy medical advisor. Um, and those are the main concerns we've heard as this bill's worked through the process. Okay, Representative Zerwas uh, again moves the DE3 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <laughs> the amendment is adopted. Representative Zerwas, to your bill. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, House File 1604 is a bill that really will help uh, prevent needless deaths from simple things that seem unthreatening to most of us. Peanuts, insect bites, even buttermilk pancakes. Just this past summer, a Bemidji teenager died from eating pancakes that he thought were dairy-free, but in fact were not. He had forgotten his uh, epinephrine pen and sadly died uh, from that severe allergic reaction. Uh, severe allergic reactions cause approximately 1,500 deaths annually with children and adolescents most at risk. It's estimated currently that one in 13 children in the U.S. has a food allergy. There are approximately 90,000 um, emergency room visits uh, each year due to that type of reaction. Uh, this bill uh, will build on current Minnesota law that involves schools to have the auto injectors. Um, and this will open it up to a broader uh, subset of areas similar to where we have AEDs um, around the community to provide uh, more community access. We have a few testifiers, and uh, I'll turn it over to the testifiers in the interest of brevity, and then we'll have uh, questions and follow-up if need be. All right. Uh, thank you and welcome to the committee. If you could please introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Uh, thank you, 
Chair and Committee. My name is Nona Narvaez and I serve pro bono as the Executive Director of the Anaphylaxis and Food Allergy Association of Minnesota, often known as AFA. And I represent the over 200,000 Minnesotans who have food allergies. Many of those have life-threatening food allergies and we have witnessed uh, anaphylactic reactions in my son and in other members of our organization. This bill would benefit them, but also those people who have reactions to insect bites, such as bee stings, wasp stings, or to medications. So this is an, an excellent bill. Uh, as the representative Zirwa said, it's very similar to having AEDs where you can have it when you need it because obviously accidents and anaphylactic reactions are not ever planned. I'd like to turn um, uh, my time over to my son here who has a few words and can describe what it's like to have a reaction. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. If you could please introduce yourself for the record and give us your testimony. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I am Max Narvaez, known as Son. And so I have survived through multiple allergic reactions over the over course of my life. And anaphylactic rea reactions can become very severe and also can change the, within the same individual. Like I have had um, throat closing at one point, I have had vomiting at a different point, and so it changes in the same individual pretty much every time. So then also the main reason that our group was started is because my parents just had no idea what was happening when I was a baby, and so they started to start a support group. And so the pretty much if you imagine that you had a college student who didn't know they had anaphylaxis or one that knew they had anaphylaxis but only carried one epinephrine auto injector with them, then they may need that extra auto injectors or those auto injectors to help them actually survive the reaction until the medical assistance arrives. And also at State Fair or Minnesota Zoo or a baseball stadium or even a shopping mall, all places where there's a delay in the emergency services because there is so much area they have to cover. So those are the main reasons why we need to let venues obtain non-patient specific epinephrine to use in case of an anaphylactic emergency. And it could just save lives. Thank you. All right, Mr. Nerv. Baez, thank you for uh, your testimony and sharing your story tonight with us. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify on this bill? Seeing no one, we'll move to member questions. Are there questions for Representative Zerwas or the testifiers? Uh, Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, to Representative Zerwas or to the testifiers, I, I just want to make sure I understand um, the, app, the applicability of this, right? So you list in the language um, likely participants, colleges, universities, daycares, not schools, um, but also give a caveat that the commissioner could authorize others. And I'm just wondering what might fall into that bucket or if you've thought that through or if the commissioner or the department has had any advice on that front. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And representative, uh, two years ago, the legislature passed a law that allowed schools to have stock epinephrine, non-patient specific epinephrine. So uh, the state of Minnesota covers that area. It covers educational institutions, uh, K through 12. This would uh, allow colleges and universities and different entities, but also gives the Minnesota Department of Health the discretion to add different categories. Basically, our thought was that we would start with these categories and then as the department became more comfortable and and um, uh, skilled at uh, approving different entities that they would expand it with the thought that of different places like zoos, museums, uh, restaurants uh, is, uh, is done in other states. So this isn't to limit it by any means at all. It's just that these were the, the starting 
uh, entities that we thought might be the most logical ones to begin with. Representative Murphy. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and um, Representative Zerwas, you've probably talked with the Commissioner of Health, um, and I'm just thinking through, you know, going forward, how um, the Commissioner would, you know, as they make those decisions, then make the public aware of that. And if you don't have an answer now, that's okay, but we should probably think that part through. Representative Zerwas. Mr. Chair, members, Representative Murphy, yeah, and I think that's something that we can discuss moving forward, how to bring out that awareness that, you know, if and when this group is then okay uh, by the commissioner, how the word gets out. And he, you understand, we're trying to kind of walk the fine line of what the department can do without incurring costs so we can move this forward and, and try to kind of do that dance as, as well. Because um, the last thing we want to do is delay something like this. But, but that's certainly something that I would love to work with you on with as we move forward. Representative Murphy. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair and Representative Zerwas. I, I think this is important legislation. Um, and so my questions are really about being helpful. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Representative Loeffler. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and maybe um, since you're uh, sitting in for our, our regular chair, you're going to have to phone a friend on the, on the staff. But um, this the previous bill had specific appropriations. and. Since we're the Appropriations Committee and we're preparing to put together the budget, I'm wondering, you know, this bill doesn't have an appropriation <coughs> line, although it has some responsibilities for the Commissioner of Health. And I'm wondering if um, this bill actually needs an appropriation line and, and or whether or not we've requested a fiscal note. Um, you know, in the Tax Committee, we don't hear a bill until we actually have a revenue note. And we're getting close down to the wire. And if the requests haven't gone in, we won't get them in time to make um, the funding decisions. So I just wondered what the status is of requesting fiscal notes on the bills that have been referred to us that we're hearing. Thank you, Representative Loeffler. I think Mr. Berg has an answer for us. Mr. Chair, Representative Loeffler, there is not a fiscal note request on this bill. I did communicate with the Department of Health, and they declined to put a cost on this. Representative Loeffler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I always like to hear when a, an agency feels like a good thing can be handled without um, additional appropriations. Sure. But um, <clears throat> but my, my question is also just broader. Are we, for ones that we haven't gotten that kind of confirmation, are we requesting fiscal notes so we'll actually know what the estimated cost of these items are? Because some of them clearly do have a cost. Um, and is that kind of the requests are in generally? Mr. Berg. Mr. Chair, Representative Loeffler, uh, certainly for tonight's agenda, bills that need fiscal notes have them. Uh, others, I'm prepared to comment that basically, as I just did, and I've con had conversation with the department. Other bills that are scheduled for hearings now that I believe need fiscal notes are in the request line. Um, we're having some challenging juggling with the departments, getting some done with our <coughs> schedule changing, but there are requests in. <coughs> Representative Law. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Berg. Glad to hear that. We just always know that it's a lot of work to do our fiscal notes because we do a lot of bills, and the earlier we do them, the faster we get them back. So I'm glad the process is moving. Thank you. <coughs> Representative Zerwas. And Mr. Chair, members, uh, and Representative Loeffler, the big change um, occurred with the DE3 in changing, <laughs> taking the impotence for uh, training development and delivery off of the shoulders of the department and having it be done by the nonprofit. And I think that was the big change, um, as I understand it, in removing the need uh, for the fiscal note. And then there was, I think in the previous version, um, it, it required the department to develop a list of places that epinephrine autoinjectors could be eligible. And that's why it's a little bit more fluid as Representative Murphy and I were just talking about to take that responsibility uh, away as well um, to avoid exactly that uh, difficulty. All right, follow thank up you. Representative Loeffler. Okay, Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, is it uh, Mr. Narvaez? No, Narvaez, yes. Narvaez, uh, great testimony, thank you. You have no idea how um, impactful it is to, to hear firsthand testimony on this. Good job, you have a bright future, no question about it. Um, so, um, Representative Zerwas, if you spoke to this, uh, forgive me, um, 
what about walk us through the the liability issues are there any liabilities around this uh, you know this is uh, good faith if you will you see somebody that's having an allergic reaction you respond accordingly is there any type of liability concerns that that we may or may not be addressing here representative Zerwas. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, Representative Hamilton, great question. In the DE3, line 3.13, uh, subdivision 6, it has the, I think what is standard uh, Good Samaritan protections uh, language in there for just that reason. Thank you, Representative Chair. Hamilton. The bill did go through civil law too, so it Wonderful. You Thank got you. that clearance as well. Are there any f other final questions for Representative Zerwas? <laughs> Seeing none, Representative Zerwas, any final words? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, this is a great bill, great supporters, and great uh, grassroots effort uh, moving this forward. And uh, being that it has a, a, a no fiscal impact, I'm very hopeful to see this in the final bill. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll renew my motion. All right, Representative Zerwas renews his motion that House File 1604, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS omnibus bill. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails and House File 1604, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Bill. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Okay, next, if Representative Detmer would please make his way down. Representative Detmer, <clears throat> we will welcome you to the committee. And I will move that House File 329 be laid over for possible <coughs> inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Bill. We have the bill before us, and there is an author's amendment titled A15-0193. I will move the A15-0193. Representative Detmer to the amendment. Mr. Chair and uh, committee members, it's a technical uh, amendment. Uh, just we needed to insert uh, after the last committee meeting, we <clears throat> suggested that we uh, insert a word uh, on line uh, page 1, line 24, after... Uh, permanently insert uh, physical uh, physically and also I have uh, the a15 uh, 194 uh, amendment also which is a technical oh, okay and thank you representative Detmer and it's uh, my understanding that both of the amendments that were drafted for tonight were drafted to the original House file 329 and we're on the first engrossment here that's um, correct but it's my understanding that we do not need an oral amendment to uh, do that um, to make sure that the instructions are right, uh, the clerk will be able to get that taken care of. So, Mr. Chair, uh, A15194, do you have that amendment? Yes, we do. Okay. Are there any questions for the A15 0193 amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The A15-0193 amendment is adopted. <coughs> I will also move the A15-0194 amendment, Representative Detmer. Again, uh, we just had to insert some words uh, to get the, the bill in uh, the order that we wanted it. So. Okay, are there any questions for Representative Detmer on this amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A15-0, oh, sorry, Representative Murphy. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, I got my hand up late. Um, so, Mr. Chair, <coughs> Representative Detmer, um, it's, I read this quickly. Um, what I think I understand is that uh, if we proceed with this, the cost for it would come out of existing budget as we move forward? That's correct. That's correct, Mr. Detmer. Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other further questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A15-0194 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The A15-0194 amendment is adopted. Representative Detmer, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And in the last session, uh, those that were here last session, all of you can probably remember voting in favor of a similar bill of this one. It was a bill passed by the Senate unanimously and also by the House provided employer paid benefits to employees who, of correction facilities who were assaulted by, by offenders and uh, rendered totally uh, permanently disabled as defined by Minnesota statute. Uh, that bill was prompted by an investigator at the Minnesota Correction Facility in Stillwater who is a constituent of mine and uh, who suffered traumatic brain injury at the hands of a known gang leader and an inmate 
and the investigator was also totally permanently disabled and will suffer after effects the rest of his life. However, the bill uh, was restrictive. Uh, it did not include employees of the Correctional uh, Retirement Plan or employees of the Minnesota Security Hospitals. Uh, it was narrowed only to meet the needs of, of that situation uh, with the uh, correction facilities. So basically, this legislation requires the Minnesota Department of Corrections and the Minnesota Department of Human Services to pay for the employee's share of their insurance premiums. I know my constituent, after he was totally disabled, uh, him and his wife, after uh, workman's comp and everything else was, was used up, uh, they start selling off things in their home and so forth just to be able to, to afford insurance. And uh, what this bill will do is provide insurance uh, uh, for those people who are totally disabled. Um, only employees of the security hospitals and correction facilities will be eligible. Uh, these payments would be begin when the employee is, is determined to be totally and permanently disabled under the Workman's Compensation Law, MS 176.101, and continue until the employees are fully medi on medi uh, Medicare eligible. Uh, by the time the employees become certified to be totally permanently disabled, their workers' compensation and vacation, sick leave, and pay must be exhausted. Uh, heading down the road of unintended hardship and financial ruin, this is why we are coming forward with this piece of the legislation. There is no retroactivity in the legislation, and last year the Department of Corrections estimated that up to two of their employees every 15 years uh, would meet this threshold. So we're not talking a lot, a lot of people, but those that do find themselves in this situation uh, are really in a hardship. Uh, they agreed, and they agreed to uh, absorb the cost. And I know the governor has has uh, shown, uh, even in his budget, has shown uh, funding in the budget for this too. So there is a fiscal note, but uh, um, the way the uh, bill is is uh, is worded right now, that uh, they would absorb the cost, the, the agencies. And I do have a, a guest uh, here to testify. Okay, welcome to the committee. And if you could please introduce yourself and. Give us your testimony. Sure. Mr. Chair, members, thank you. My name is Richard Kajewski. I'm the Public Affairs and Communications Director for the Minnesota Association of Professional Employees. Just one point of clarification. I don't think uh, any of the agencies have agreed to absorb it this year, which is the point of the fiscal note. I just want to make that uh, pretty clear. However, last year, uh, the Department of Corrections did agree to absorb uh, the people who uh, were receiving those benefits uh, under the statute that uh, is now in place. And in 2014, uh, the law that was enacted uh, required the state to pay the employer contribution for health and dental uh, insurance under the state employee group insurance plan. And I just, uh, Representative Detmer did a good job describing this bill. I just reiterate a few things that are different. Uh, one more time, this benefit under the statute or, or under the bill that's before you applies only when the qualifying disability directly results from an assault while the employee was employed. Uh, and second, it expands the application of the benefit by making it available to employees assaulted by a person under correctional supervision for a criminal offense. Uh, and I think the, the provision that really has this bill in this committee that expands the application of the benefit to employees assaulted by a client or patient at both the Minnesota Sex Offender Program or a state-operated forensic services program. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, we, and we do have a couple of questions here. Representative Loeffler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm wondering whether the addition of physically disabled does in any way um, limit potentially an employee. I think of um, what some of them have said they've experienced and seen. And if your um, your physical uh, things, may, maybe a broken a concussion, broken legs might heal, but your ability to trust others in the work environment and other situations may make it difficult for you to return to that kind of position. So I'm wondering if by narrowing this to um, those for which it is a only physical disability is really um, <coughs> potentially going to close out some people who might have experienced in an, as a result of an assault significant enough trauma that their ability to return to this work is, is compromised. Mr. Kulajas. Mr. Chair and Representative Loeffler, I would agree with you. I think that that is a, a fact that does happen. I've seen it when I worked for the Department of Corrections uh, in my career. I would also state that uh, this was an agreement with the Minnesota State Retirement System to make sure that we're covering physic people who are physically assaulted and physically disabled 
Um, without that term in there, uh, the, the fiscal note would be drastically expanded, probably include um, a cost from the Minnesota State Retirement System because in this bill, uh, we are evaluating people to be totally and permanently disabled under the Correctional Retirement Plan. There is no definition of totally and permanently disabled for Correctional Retirement uh, Plan employees, uh, only for general employees. Uh, MSRS has agreed to evaluate those under that same plan uh, at no additional cost, but to restrict that and not add on to a significant cost, both from DHS and the Department of Corrections, uh, we agreed to put that term in the bill. Representative Walther. Well, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chair. I can appreciate that to get something moving this year, um, maybe a smaller step than what is needed, but I would be glad to work with you to broaden the horizons on an understanding of, because I could see some really dedicated state employees who would lose their career and, um, and all that that means and not be able to meet the, the standards before us. So thank you for continuing to pursue this. Yeah. Mr. Chair, if I could just respond one. Mr. Kolejewski. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Lawler, I'd be happy to do that uh, and maybe uh, work on something during the interim as well. One of the difficulties is um, the evaluation process is significantly longer, which drags this process out longer for uh, employees. It's a fact that when someone is assaulted, if they're not totally and permanently disabled, um, that they generally do have those difficulties in life and continuing employment in, the, in a correctional facility or any of the other uh, DHS facilities. Um, I also think that um, when you look at the mental disability, if you will, uh, it's expansive enough uh, because of the, the language for a physical disability means that you cannot work almost in any job. There's no employment out there for you. You're so severely disabled and there's so few people who qualify for that, that this opens the floodgate and it probably, as I mentioned before, this would probably have a, a significantly increased fiscal cost for, for all entities involved. But it'd be good to look into, I agree. Thank you. Uh, Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was just listening to Representative Loeffler's questions and um, share that sentiment um, that we should consider that. And also from the perspective of the, the current workforce, so that if someone was um, so severely disabled, but not a physical, but emotional disability, um, they could create, you know, some weakness in the chain. So I can see that. You see that as well, and I understand that it's harder to see, but it still exists. Um, I uh, I wanted to know if you can give us any guidance um, about roughly the number of people um, we're talking about here. Mr. Kolejewski. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Murphy, I think the numbers I received from MSRS, if you can bear with me one second, I believe the number is 78 people are receiving a disability under the Correctional Retirement Plan since 1981. Um, I asked uh, Dave Bergson, the Executive Director of MSRS, how many he estimated were <coughs> in that pool uh, as a result of an assault from an offender in one of the facilities. <coughs> and he said, and, and I anticipated that, he would have to physically go through each and every file to determine that number exactly. Um, however, he said it's very few. And he said less than a handful. <coughs> Representative Murphy. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that. They are hard jobs um, that mm -hmm. those uh, Minnesotans are doing uh, in correctional facilities and, and other of these facilities that put employees at risk. And I am glad to see you're pursuing this, Representative Detmer. Um, one more question, Mr. Chair, and that is um, I see that we're asking that the employee, the employer would pay their share. Is the employee responsible for a part of the coverage cost as well? Mr. Kolejewski. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Murphy, the employee would have to continue to pay the employee share and if uh, at any point they defaulted in that, their insurance would, the employer could end their insurance coverage. It's important, I think, to remember this is the worst of the worst. That's why this would apply in the last 20 to 30 years to so few people. These people are severely disabled. It affects their families. It affects their uh, income for their families. It affects their livelihoods. Um, some of these people have had kids in the past uh, at different levels, small kids, high school kids. The, uh, Mr. Campa, who was the uh, subject of the bill last session, uh, still had kids in high school. This is a severe hardship. He cannot hold down any job, much less uh, he has a steel plate in the back of his head. He has severe memory loss and issues. He has a difficult time even with a GPS uh, driving from one place to another. So um, this is a person who would prefer to have gone to work today like you and I. 
and Mr. Chair and uh, uh, Mr. Campman when we were mentioning, he was an assistant wrestling coach of mine, worked with our youth youth at one time too. So he came came to me with this situation. Yeah. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, first of all, I, I think this is a terrific idea, and it's really pretty terrible to think that we have employees that are in such a situation and, and it, it's um, I think the bill is completely warranted my my question though is why um, and, and I understand you, you probably need to start with the limited scope of the bill but I just think there may be other employees who maybe would be injured on the job and maybe I guess may, let me make this a question are there employees who would be injured severely on the job in a manner that wouldn't be from an assault so that they wouldn't qualify under this bill, but who in fact would be just as blameless as a person under this bill and just as injured on the job as a person under this bill and might be in this situation but not getting the benefit that we're giving people here? Is that a concern or is that, does that just not happen usually? Mr. Kolajewski. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative, absolutely it happens. I mean, we all know and have heard of uh, the number of accidents we have with MnDOT employees on an annual basis uh, through road construction. They certainly spend a significant amount of money advertising it, and uh, we enforce, the state enforces laws to re that require people to slow down in construction zones as a result of these types of accidents. Um, you know, I, I wish we covered everybody. Uh, I certainly would advocate for it. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of people who uh, really protect uh, the citizens of Minnesota and even outside our borders from the worst of the worst, uh, people who have to be incarcerated and locked up um, and, and really risk their lives every day. And so, you know, I worked in a correctional facility and I, I've been to all but one of the facilities in the state of Minnesota. And I would say that every employee who's hired and goes to the academy for the Department of Corrections, for example, certainly understands that there's a calculated risk. Uh, that comes with their job. I don't think any employee walks through the gate every day thinking that they'll no longer be able to provide for their families and children. Uh, I don't believe that to be true. And I think that that's a significant loss. It's tragic uh, when it happens to other people and I certainly uh, think we should look at it from, from in other angles. I would say that there's an avenue for uh, disability as far as the retirement and the cost uh, to, to recoup some income for people who are severely disabled in an accident um, at work. Um, there's workers' comp settlements and that sort of thing. These people here that we're talking about today, we're only talking about benefits, not income. So it does apply to everybody else. I agree with you, Representative. Um, it's just, it is a much more narrow scope, and it is because there's a, a significant push from my members. I think ASME would agree. Uh, this also covers their members. It covers nurses. Uh, this is a little bit to equal the playing field with some what some of the benefits that law enforcement and other entities have who are actually uh, working with these people on a day-to-day -day basis. Representative Playplane. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. I guess I didn't understand that parity with law enforcement and so on, and that does make a lot of sense. Um, and let me just finally ask you, since we are a health committee, mm -hmm. just, um, and so our main focus here is on the, um, probably on the security hospital and on the sex offender um, right. program, do you think this will help us in our efforts to recruit staff and keep staff? I mean, I'm sure nobody ever wants to think that they would be in this situation, you know, God forbid. But do you think it'll give employees a little bit more of a comfort level to, to continue to do this work? Or is it just that the difficulties of the job so overwhelm this that, that it won't make a difference to those who are before needs, shall we say? Mr. Kolodzewski. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative, I think the biggest difference here is it shows that the employer is actually supporting the employees that uh, they're employing. Uh, the biggest uh, mark that this has made is with current employees in our correctional settings and in our DHS facilities. They saw what happened. It was uh, aired on Channel 11 on three different occasions uh, during last session, and it's a big issue for our state employees right now. Uh, to think that, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, Representative Cornish has another member in his district who would benefit from this bill uh, today. Um, it's, it's tragic, it continues to happen, it affects their families, and nobody wants to see anybody go through it. Um, do I think it's a recruiting tool? No. 
Uh, I think there's a lot of other things I'd be happy to have a conversation with you that'd be more appropriate offline about uh, recruiting tools, but uh, I'll just leave it at that. I think this, this says a lot about an employer who wants to support the employees when something this tragic really happens. And I think that, that that's been my push. That's certainly been the conversations I've had with the administration and with uh, both agencies. Uh, finally, thank you, Mr. Chair. And finally, <coughs> I guess not so much a recruiting tool. I mean, we, no one would expect that. But in terms of morale, I guess that's the way I want to put it. Will the employees feel at least that this is, well, you kind of answered that, that they'll feel a little bit more supported by the effort to do this? Mm -hmm. And I think that alone would probably make it worth doing. So thank you. Representative Loeffler. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just happened to notice the deletion on line 2.3 of hospital, which I assume is just because it's considered redundant with <coughs> medical, but I did want to make sure that we're not taking away a hospitalization coverage benefit by that deletion. Representative Detmer? I can. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative, yeah, it's, it's just a, a clarification. To, uh, medical covers it. Thank you. I, I thought that was true, but I just wanted to be sure. I think actually it's a, Mr. Chair and Representative, I think actually it's a, a, a one of the corrections that DHS made to the bill. So we certainly, uh, at least on the language part of it, have spent a significant uh, amount of time making sure that the language is accommodating to everybody. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, any final questions for Representative Detmer? And is there anyone in the audience who wishes to <coughs> testify in the bill? Seeing none, uh, closing remarks, Representative Detmer? Well, thank you, and uh, also for my testifier with the great knowledge that he has of, of what we're talking about here today, and, uh, and also for the questions that were asked. Those are good, uh, good questions all the way around, and, uh, and thank you for uh, hearing the bill, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, get it through the, uh, with the omnibus bill. All right, thank you, Representative Detmer. With that, I renew my motion that House File 329, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Bill. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. House File 329, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Bill. Thank you, Representative Detmer. Representative Murphy? All right, next we have Representative Murphy. Representative Murphy moves that House File 507 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Bill. We have the bill before us. Representative Murphy, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I drew the short chair. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I am uh, grateful that we are hearing once again House File 507, which uh, uh, moves to redefine Our Lady of Peace residential, uh, it's right now, Our Lady of Peace residential facility, which is in the district I represent, is currently uh, defined as a skilled nursing facility. It's licensed as a skilled nursing facility. But their book of work is uh, uh, in, in uh, residence hospice care uh, for a largely indigent population. And this piece of legislation would relicense them as a residential hospice facility, uh, serving no more than 21 uh, uh, residents at a time. Uh, it has no fiscal cost. Mr. Stanislav here runs that facility. And he is here to talk a little bit about it, and I hope to earn your support. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Stanislav, if you could please introduce yourself for the record and give us your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Joe Stanislav, and I'm the uh, administrator of Our Lady of Peace Home here in St. Paul. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, last year, Our Lady of Peace Home provided $4 million of free care to over 300 Minnesotans dying from incurable disease. Since Pearl Harbor Day 1941, all the care that's been provided in the home has been given free. And that's to thousands of persons that have been cared for there. Passage of House File 507 would formally recognize that Our Lady of Peace is not a nursing home, but truly a residential hospice and should be regulated as one. Uh, Lengths of stays are less than two weeks in the home. We get the sickest of the sick, and we're known for that um, all over the Twin Cities. That's uh, the people we try to give the most care to, and, and typically uh, only indigent persons are allowed in the home. 
Um, we have agreed to become Medicare certified to ensure regulators that the highest standards of care and life safety will be provided in the future. Um, we believe that the passage of this bill has no impact on future state budgets. Thank you for considering this bill. Thank you, Mr. Stanislaw, for your testimony and for the work you are doing on this. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify on the bill? Seeing none, are there any questions from members? No. Mr. Chairman, I'll do quick. Uh, Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, Representative Murphy, or, or to, uh, to the testifier, it looks like we're reducing the number of beds. Um, how much, uh, is there, is there a, a large demand uh, for the hospice care? Are we still going to be able to uh, meet the needs, I guess, uh, would be my question. Mr. Stanislav. Well, we reduced uh, from 40 to 21. The reason we did that was originally they were four bedrooms. <coughs> so now we have only singles and doubles for patient privacy. Um, is there more demand? I think we're meeting the demand uh, pretty well for indigents. Um, you know, there's, there's other hospice providers that um, are, you know, pay as you go or for profit or pay or nonprofits that charge. We're the only one that doesn't charge. And so far, we think we're able to, to meet that need. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any further questions? Seeing none, Representative Murphy renews her motion that House File 507 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Bill. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion prevails, and House File 507 is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Bill. Thank, Thank you, you for your Chair time. And members. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Our Lady of Peace really is a mighty facility, and it's great that you're considering it today. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Representative Norton with House File 1315. Representative Norton, uh, welcome to the committee. 1350, excuse me. I move House File 1350 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Bill. We have the bill before us, and there is an author's amendment titled A2. I will move the A2 amendment. Representative Norton, when you're ready, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, thank you for hearing the bill. I have uh, the, the uh, amendment is simply making some language changes that um, the committee has agreed to. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. But and it will also, I believe, help us um, be parallel with the Senate's bill as well. OK. All those in favor of adopting the A2 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The A2 amendment is adopted. Representative Norton, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, we have before you the Non-Emergency Medical Transportation Advisory Committee's recommendations. Um, as many of you know, um, the OLA report a number of years ago uh, raised a number of issues. I think it was 2011, raised a number of issues uh, about our non-emergency medical transportation um, system in the state of Minnesota. And to that end, there have been a number of bills. I think Representative McDonald actually carried the bill to uh, organize the task force or the advisory committee of which I'm a member. Uh, and this is the work of that committee. Um, some la language was passed last year, um, but there was no funding uh, to move all of our recommendations forward. And so this year, um, we're hoping uh, as the economy's improved and we have a better uh, fiscal outlook for the state, that the department and the committee will see fit to, to uh, fund these recommendations. And so uh, what we have is um, a bill before you that does th pr primarily three things. Um, one of the things the committee really worked on and talked about for years is that we wanted all the vehicles used in non-emergency emergency medical transportation service to meet the same requirements. Um, currently, the system has had two uh, different kinds of uh, uh, transportation system, two different systems, and they had one required um, vehicle registration and uh, driver uh, training and the other did not and we want to make them all equal so that is the first part the second one uh, the second part I'll talk about addresses language changes for rate increases and I believe you have seen a, a portion of that um, in two separate bills that are moving um, both of those are included in here one is removing the four and a half percent cut that was put in place for many many um, 
providers across the state during the recession, and almost all of them have been, uh, that 4.5% has been removed. This particular group did not, was not removed and has been sitting with that 4.5% cut since then. And also what we call RUCA, um, which is uh, miles where there's, uh, um, in the country where there's a long distance traveled to pick up a client and there's no one in the vehicle. Um, so that'll be addressed in, in there as well. And um, the, the additional component, which I think is really interesting, is we're trying to make certain that in non-emergency medical transportation, that folks, um, that the law says, the federal law says, are to take um, the, a route to the closest physician that can provide the right care, and they're supposed to use the cheapest method of transportation possible. Um, and some of that could include reimbursement for mileage in their own car. It could include reimbursement for mileage if a friend takes them. And in rural Minnesota, often it's a volunteer. Um, so uh, we want to bump up the mileage reimbursement for those modes too. It is so low that it really didn't even make sense for anyone to do it. And in fact, I believe for one of them it was something like 19 cents a mile reimbursement. I don't know if that was the personal or the volunteer. It might have been volunteer. It was so low that, you know, it was a detriment really to get people to do that. So those modes or those methods of transportation also are getting a, a bump in the mileage. And it's not huge. But we do think it will make a difference in people taking the cheapest method of transportation rather than just relying on um, a more expensive service. Uh, the other thing that we'll do is if we can get more people in the state of Minnesota, it has a very uh, a low percentage of people taking uh, part in public transportation as a method. Um, it, if we can change that, that it will free up money um, to better, uh, for better use on the people who do require uh, a wheelchair or stretcher mode of <laughs> transportation, and it'll allow uh, help us pay for that four and a half percent and perhaps more in the future. Um, and I just also want to mention for many of our providers, um, I think we'll hear from one of them, these folks have been waiting for years for an increase. They have gone through the gas price hikes with nothing and their business is run on the price of gasoline and their, and their uh, employees. And so they have really struggled in our community. Um, we had uh, services cut, people wouldn't pick up in the evenings anymore, uh, middle of the night services and you know, so what do you do if you're in a wheelchair and no one will come to get you? You sit for hours waiting for the 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. pickup. So we really do need to address this. Um, and the last piece that I'll just mention, and then I'll hand it off to Sue, who <coughs> may or may not want to say more here. I think she probably will. She's been the chair of our committee. Um, we also are changing um, the, t the mode of transportation that people are, uh, will um, call and, and get approval for. And so that, there's a portion of that in there as well. But as we move to a different um, method of service, we do need to make certain that we fund it. And so just there's some language in here that protects counties. If we do not fund that portion, the changes to the modes of transportation and, and how we do it and, and the new technology that will be needed to do this, that um, it will continue as it is. And there will be no, we're not pushing any expenses off onto the county that they're not going to be paid for. So there's some uh, language in there that you'll see that protects counties. So that's just an overview of the bill. Actually, for your information, that sh the House research piece, as I mentioned to the HHS committee, uh, policy committee, is excellent and really does walk through uh, the bill very well. So um, if I haven't covered it all, it's in there, and Sue can talk further. Thank you, Ms. Abderholden. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, members, Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota and um, Co-Chair of the Non-Emergency Medical Transportation um, Advisory Committee. And I'm just here to really encourage you to see if there's a way that you can find some funding for um, the NEMT providers. We've been working on this issue for many, many years, um, looking at the OLA report and their recommendations, trying to move this forward. And we really have addressed um, many of the recommendations that were in that report. Um, I think some of the biggest things um, is, first of all, making sure that the vehicles and drivers um, all operate under the same um, rubric. I think that's really important. We have people who are vulnerable who don't, um, don't use the wheelchair, and so they're taking taxis and things like that, and we need to make sure that those vehicles are safe and that those drivers um, are also safe drivers. Um, I think the other thing is the committee actually, um, as you know, has been not always on the same page, and we are absolutely on the same page um, today. And uh, part of it is to really figure out, can we um, find a way to uh, increase, first of all, the personal mileage rate, because that has been very, very low. Um, and we think this will actually help people use this mode of transportation versus other ones. Um, and also looking at the volunteer transport, which is used in the rural areas, <laughs> increasing that by 200%. 
Uh, the problem with the rural areas is that um, they have what's called no load miles. So you have a volunteer driving maybe 65 or 75 miles one way, they drive back home and they don't get reimbursed for that. Um, and then they go back and pick the person up depending on how long they're gonna be there. So that can be really problematic and a disincentive. Um, I do also think that the, um, the rate reduction that the providers received um, uh, several years ago, four and a half percent, really did really did harm them and we did lose some providers and we don't want to lose any more. If people can't get a ride to their medical appointment, they're not able to access medical care. Um, the other change I just want to mention that um, Representative Norton um, talked a little bit about is that you know we've had this ATS system and this STS system and we wanted to move, um, move it all together, which we did legislatively last year and, and also added a new mode of transportation called protected transportation um, for people who have a serious mental illness who are in crisis so they don't have to be driven by police or by ambulances. But we haven't been able to implement that because we need to have new rates um, because there, you know, there's changes in those modes of transportation. Um, so that would be the other area that the um, committee did recommend um, to move forward on. Um, we did um, at least um, say that those were the top things that the committee wanted. And again, um, everyone is on the same page, which um, as you know, on this particular subject area has not always happened. So thank you. Thanks, Ms. Abner Holden. Mr. Chair, members, Buck McAlpin of the Minnesota Ambulance Association. A couple different groups that sit on this committee is the Minnesota Hospital Association we had put on there, the Ambulance Association, and R80, a group we work with of rural providers. Representative Norton did a nice job talking about that, that uh, we really only have a handful of rural folks <laughs> left that do this, and uh, the rest of them kind of went out of business. And many of our large EMS operations had large transportation, non-emergency divisions that we've just closed down because we couldn't operate them anymore as we try to do the ambulance side. It is quite a burden across the state of Minnesota without strong non-emergency transportation that that turns to the ambulance providers after six at night to take a fully staffed ambulance and have them drive somebody back 13 miles to the nursing home. And that's probably the only ambulance available for a thousand mile square radius. So we work very hard and support all the work this group's done to be sure that not only we support the non-emergency group, that those two pieces tie in very importantly with what we do in emergency care. And uh, we get a little uh, lucky here in the Metro that we seem to have a glutton of providers that do this. But what the uh, Kim and Sue talked about, we want those to be high quality providers when we send grandma home back to the nursing home at three in the morning. And this bill addresses lots of that. Uh, the rate piece quick like Mr. Chair, as you look at your omnibus bill, we did have a bill in here a few weeks ago, the four and a half percent, and the RUCA piece of Representative Schumacher's that was uh, put together before we had this legislation, but we are uh, neck and neck of what that looks like as we work with the committee on a bill that supports that, and this is also being heard Friday in the Senate, where we'll line that up and work with you on making sure we have one good piece of legislation to move forward. Great. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, first of all, congratulations to you all who've worked so hard on this, because I watched it quite a bit from a distance. Very often glad I was not on the task force, because it was quite a slog. <laughs> and um, I think it's great to get to, um, to get to something that everybody can stand behind and that solves a big, big problem for the state, because those of you who've been around a while know that this has just been a real problem. The question I have is about the fiscal note. I'm just getting a chance to look at it for the first time. And um, Representative Norton, I thought I recalled that at some point it was supposed to save money because people might be shifted from, mm -hmm. because there are people who really should be taking modes of transportation like a bus mm -hmm. or like getting a ride in their friend's car or something like that, that right now are using more expensive kinds. But I'm not seeing that or I'm not understanding where that is in the fiscal note. So could you talk about that a little bit? Thank you. Representative Norton. Mr. Chair and Representative Liebling, um, I actually uh, asked about that. Was a, this is a new fiscal note tonight, but the, it's not in here and it wasn't in the last one either. And we, we talked about this in our meeting last week during spring break on Wednesday, we all met. And it is going to be um, a challenge, but I think one, um, I personally would have loved to put some targets in here that we're gonna target, that we're gonna switch X percent onto, uh, you know, volunteer or public transportation, and we didn't do that. Um, but 
it is going to take a process change as we shift into the new modes, and, and this is all coming, uh, when we do that and we reevaluate folks when they call in, new people will, will um, be able to be assessed through the new handbook that we put together over the last couple years and be walked through and put on something appropriate at the time. People that are already getting it, some of them are going to have to be shifted from what they're getting now to the new transportation mode that would be more appropriate and, and maybe a little more cumbersome for some of them. It's wonderful to be able to pick up a call and have somebody show up at your front door, a little harder to make yourself take a bus or, or get a volu you know, volunteer. But as we have the money to do that and we start promoting it, I think you'll see that shift. But it isn't shown in this fiscal note. I think it's something the committee is going to take up the challenge of how do we market this and how do we reassess current clients to get them on a different level as we change the modes. But that's going to happen in the years moving ahead. So I do think it will make a difference, but it is not evident in the fiscal note. Representative Liebling. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Norton. And yeah, that's too bad that that doesn't show up. But just so members understand, and in case I don't understand, just correct me if I'm wrong. So there is a, an individual assessment that each client gets, right? And so the mode of transportation they are supposed to take is individualized not only to their needs, but also to what's available to them, right? Yes. So if somebody's out in rural Minnesota, no one's going to say, go take the bus, because there is no bus, right? Absolutely. So it's an individualized assessment, and that's, you know, they'll say, go get the police officers to come and get you, Representative Schoen. But anyway, um, you know, mm -hmm. just so people understand. So this is trying to get people to take the least expensive, appropriate transportation <coughs> that needs. Mr. Chair, and that's absolutely true. And it is done on an assessment basis. And we will have to rotate through those people already assessed as the new modes come into effect. And, and that just will take time. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Loeffler. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know that in the Metro we have been assessing people and asking them to take the bus and and doing that so it's not totally new a new approach at all um, but I will just say that as a day on the hill um, today in the earlier committee meeting I had to step out to uh, meet with some college students and they were here to talk about a couple of different things including transit funding and one of them lives on the number and takes the number 10 bus, which is on Central Avenue. It's my best bus service. It runs more frequently than most places that run every half hour or an hour. But she said she couldn't hardly remember the time she didn't have to stand all the way downtown and back. And for some people, riding a bus that's lurching from corner to cor corner, um, standing the entire time is also an obstacle. Um, not just whether or not you can climb up the bus steps. And so I think we really need to be sensitive to people having an appeals process when it doesn't fit for them because for some it will be a fine answer and for others it may not. Um, and we need to, to balance that out as we implement this. So I think phasing it in and, and learning as we go is a good approach. Other questions? Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Norton, just looking in the bill Try to find. Uh, I'm just vaguely familiar with the uh, non-emergency medical transportation situation. Oh, I'm joking. It was my bill that committed uh, that put the committee together uh, several and, years and, ago. So, and oh. Representative McDonald, I gave you credit. Pardon? Did I you? gave you credit. I was at another committee uh, with a bill. I would have loved to have been here. <laughs> uh, we'll give we'll give you the credit right now. Someone else already blew your horn. Please stop. Are you going to be able to fit the head off? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Anyway, before I was rudely interrupted, uh, <laughs> no. When, in regards to keeping track of the mileage, uh, Mr. McAlpine, a buck, the former mayor of Annandale, um, <laughs> the committee suggested they had recommendations that would use some uh, GPS software that would keep track of the mileage so it wasn't just hand entered. Um, and I know it was a draft earlier in a bill, but it's not in this one. Could you address that? Representative Norton. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative McDonald, there is another bill that has some other components in it, and, and that is in there, um, as well as uh, we do hope to move this whole system to a, a um, using technology in a, a wiser uh, fashion. 
but we don't have the funding for that yet either. And in fact, uh, the department's been trying some pilots and some areas are doing some wonderful pilots and that'll happen eventually as well. We're just not quite there. But there is another bill with other components and that will be part of that bill. Very good, thank you. Other questions? Seeing no other questions, uh, Representative Norton? Uh, is there any, uh, before that, is there anybody in the audience who'd like to testify for or against the bill? Seeing none, uh, Representative Norton, any concluding comments for your bill? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I know this isn't a very sexy bill, um, but many of us have spent many years working on this at uh, Representative McDonald's uh, orders. Uh, and so a lot of time and energy has been put into this. It really does need to be implemented. And as I said, it isn't as sexy or uh, heart-wrenching as some of the other issues, but it is vitally important to the number of people who use special transportation to get to their doctor appointments. And so I do hope you can find a way to fund this this year, finally, at last. Thank you, Representative Norton, Ms. Abderholden, and Mr. McAlpin. We appreciate uh, your work and all the hard work that was put into this bill and uh, for all the other folks uh, and advocates who are here and elsewhere. Appreciate that. And with that, Representative Schumacher, renews his motion that House File 1350, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Finance Bill. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. House File 1350 is laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Bill. Aye. And? I'm not. <laughs> what tick? I didn't hear you. I was there. You just oh, me. Jeez. All right. Representative Norton, are you ready with 512? <laughs> I am, Mr. Chair. All right, Representative Norton, I will move House File 12 be laid over for possible inclusion in our HHS Omnibus Finance Bill. We have the bill before us, Representative Norton. I don't see any amendments to your bill from the packet, uh, so uh, if you'd like to present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. This is taking a completely different turn. Um, and this is a, uh, a result of, uh, again, many, almost three years worth of mediation. Um, and there are a group of bills that Representative Scott, Representative Mahoney, Representative Lane, and then myself have been working on. And this is one of the components of that. Um, it is not the same bill that we started with. So uh, if you saw it earlier, it looks different. Um, but this is the engrossed version. Um, we had hoped to be able to come forward with a child uh, support calculation um, to figure out uh, payments, custody payments for, for families. I thought we had it done. And then um, as we were playing out uh, the scenarios, we found some glitches uh, in that process. And we do not want to move forward with something that will cause um, consternation and pain to uh, the people that we're trying to help here. So this is now a task force in front of you, a work group, I take that back. Um, it has a small fiscal note um, of $12,000 because the federal, um, the feds actually will pay for two thirds of the costs of this bill. Uh, and so we're asking for a work group that will help us pay and work with an economist for its short term, so it's like eight months, it'll have to be done um, by January uh, with its work, and it will bring forward an appropriate calculation so that we can pass that next year so that it will actually work for families and um, not scare the pants off them when they uh, see some of the calculations that came out like we did uh, at the end of the day. So um, it is going to provide uh, recommendations and also recommendations for uh, a long-term uh, commission, which is not in this bill, it's just asking this group to think about, talk about, and, and recommend a commission that could uh, move forward so that we're not in the position where we wait for a very long time to make changes to child support when they're needed much sooner. And so, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure if it's appropriate to put in the $12,000 um, fiscal cost in this bill with the oral amendment, or if you just want to leave it with the dots and can fill it in yourself. I'm not sure how you want to handle that. I think we'll leave it at this time, uh, Representative Norton. Okay. Um, so uh, that's what I have to say. I do have uh, the brains behind some of the, uh, the work here with me and one of the members of the three-year mediation, um, Jennifer Summerfeld. So. Ms. Summerfeld, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the tape and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jennifer Summerfeld. I am here on behalf of the Minnesota State Bar Association's Family Law Section 
And as Representative Norton said, I was also a member of the Child Custody Dialogue that worked through these groups. I am not the brains behind anything, though, clearly, because the first bill had a big mathematical error in it, which is why we've moved on to the work group. The Bar Association is enthusiastically supporting this legislation. Uh, the members of this family law section believe that it's really important that we make some changes to the parenting expense adjustment and child support calculations in order to eliminate what we've come to call the cliff. And it's a very large change that occurs in child support at 45.1% of overnight parenting time. A, a change in a couple of days in the course of a year can mean a change in child support that is hundreds of dollars a month rather than a year. It's a very large change. So the goal for our group is to even off that cliff and get rid of it. And by bringing in an economist, somebody who is a math expert, we hope to find the proper formula to do that. So thank you for hearing the bill, and I ask for your support. Thank you, Ms. Summerfield. I do have one more testifier on the list, Mr. John Kerr. Is he here? He is. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, member. My name is John Kerr. Um, I just want to, um, I was divorced in 2008. Um, these, two, th these child support changes came, came about in about 2007. And there, there are a few of us that are in that unfortunate situation of sitting right on the edge of the cliff. Um, and I've been waiting for seven years now. And it feels like it's been going on for a long time. And it keeps getting pu pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And I'm not sure if everyone kind of realizes what happens in the real world when you get a divorce, unless you've actually been through one. So let me just run through really quickly what happens. You'll, you, someone files for a divorce, and you'll, you'll go and you'll visit an attorney. And the attorney, the first questions they'll ask you is, what's your income? What's your spouse's income? How many children do you have? And based on that, they'll put those numbers in the, in the child support calculator, and they're going to come out with the numbers, right? And in Minnesota, if you do the numbers, this is real numbers, if, if two parents come in, they both have $70,000 per year of income, child support will either be $1,037 per month, or it'll be zero. It's that extreme. So if you have parenting time between 45% and 50%, it's zero. If your parenting time is 44%, it's $1,000 a month. And that's the cliff we're talking about, real numbers. If you got divorced in California, Arizona, somewhere else, it's around $350. It's a reasonable amount. So what you're doing by not making these changes this year is you're putting another year of families going through this process of it's either 50-50 or it's this extreme, there's a fight over parenting time. The first thing, the other thing the attorney's gonna tell you to do is he says, You've got to increase your parenting time before the trial. You've got to take the kids to school. You've got to do all this stuff. And both parents are doing this. And it's just a battle. And it's not worth it. So my point is this. You, you can, I think it's great that you're doing the research. And I think that needs to be done. Because there's certainly a lot of issues with this. But I also think there needs to be something that can be done this year. You need to get rid of the extremes. I mean, child support isn't a you're not going to come up with a magical calculator that produces the perfect result. If that calculator exists, every state would be using it. It doesn't exist. What you have to do is you have to reduce the extreme ends of things so parents can come up with some kind of a reasonable parenting plan with reasonable ch child support. In my case, had we had the gradual slope of, of child support, we probably would have agreed to something around 40% parenting time and $300 a month. You know, it would have been four hundred. There would have been no argument. It's been this ongoing battle. We've been to the court of appeals three times over child support, and it's a mess. The last time I went to the district court to change my parenting time, I asked the judge to increase my parenting time by seven overnights per year. That puts me at forty-five point one percent. He denied that, saying that I was only doing it for money. I was only doing it for child support a reduction in child support, and therefore that was not in the best interest of the, of the children. It's been, now the fact that I have significant parenting time has been turned against me, right? 
I can't even get seven overnights of extra parenting time. So yes, the changes are going to be dramatic. You know, the child support proposal that was the first edition of this bill, the numbers are dramatic because it goes from $1,037 per month to $300 per month. That's what it is in other states. It's dramatic. And to state that we can't move forward with a change this year because the change is so dramatic just kind of screams in my head that it's so dramatic that you have to make a change this year. You're going to add another year of families to this, another year of divorced families that are going to be struggling with the same issue of battling over parenting time. And it shouldn't be that way. Now, maybe you don't come back with the same, you know, straight line discounted parenting time grid that was in the original bill, but even if you did something as simple as reducing the what, what is now 45.1% to 42%, make it 42% and up. And 42% is kind of a magical number because many parents have six of 14 overnights when it comes to parenting time, and that's 42.8%. If you actually do a search within Google Scholar and you look in the Court of Appeals, there's a lot of cases out there where parents have 42.8% parenting time and they've gone to the Court of Appeals over this very issue because the extremes, right? And six of eight, six of 14 overnights is a, is a common schedule. And at least you could fix those cases and you'd also give parents that are getting divorced next year, unfortunately, the option to agree to a schedule at six of 14 overnights and not, not be battling over parenting time. So that's all I have. Thank you for your time. I guess I'm, I'm just, I'm hoping that something comes sooner rather than later with this kind of stuff. Because I feel like there's many of us, and a lot of us aren't here today, but there's, there's a few of us that are right on this cliff, and we've been dealing and waiting for this for seven years for some kind of relief. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. I know all of us have heard from our constituents in similar circumstances. I know it's not an easy situation, so we appreciate you coming in and your testimony for us this evening. Is there anyone else from the audience who'd like to testify for or against this bill? Seeing none, uh, Representative Norton. Could I follow up? Um, I very much appreciate Mr. Kerr. He, we communicated by email earlier today coming to share with you what, why we're doing what we're doing, why we've worked so hard to fix this. Um, the stories like that are heartbreaking, and they're not just one or two. There are many, many, as, as Representative Dean said. He's heard from constituents I suspect all of you have. Um, my hope is, you know, if the bill had passed this year, there was going to be a, an implementation of, of, you know, out a ways because you can't implement something on day one. You know, perhaps if this uh, study gets its work, work done quickly and we come to the legislature early in January next year and we pass that legislation, we can, have, we can indeed have a shorter turnaround time uh, and we don't have to push it out so far next year as a result because there are families hurting right now and there's lots of litigation happening at that cliff. He's absolutely correct at that, and it's a sin, because this really should be about what, about families, what's best for kids, and what uh, the time parents want to spend with their children, and we need to support that. All right, other questions? I'm sorry, uh, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Norton, given the gentleman's testimony and his frustration with the delay, could you just explain a little bit more what the problem was why, you know, because so that we can all sort of feel comfortable that we're not just putting it off another year. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, Representative Liebling, if I didn't have to put this off, I would not because this is a bill I've worked really hard on and have, and they can tell you, I've hounded them and, we, you know, the committee and, and I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't think we absolutely had to. So Jennifer can explain. I was even saying the same thing. Let the, let the, let people just be furious about the increases. Let's move ahead with this. But there are some significant issues, and I'll let uh, Ms. Summerfeld tell Ms. Summerfeld. you what those are. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Liebling. We introduced the bill. All of us who worked in this group thought we'd found a good solution. We modeled a system after what Oregon has, where there is kind of a curved credit parenting expense adjustment for each successive overnight. And it got rid of the cliff. It recognized that there are changes in what you do for your child with increasing parenting time. Uh, we weren't math majors, 
So we superimposed the Oregon's formula for how that curve would run on the Minnesota system. Unfortunately, that didn't account for the fact that we have a presumptively equal calculation that goes into effect at 45.1% of parenting time. The result when we received runs from the Department of Human Services were that for some people who had 45.1 or 45.3% parenting time, their child support would have tripled. And that was an unintended and unacceptable outcome. It would have caused a great deal of heartache in the system, which was the exact opposite of what we were intending. So the goal is now to find a proper formula for a curve that works for Minnesota and incorporates the presumptively equal calculation that we use so that there are not such major swings in child support. All right. Uh, Representative Murphy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, first I want to say to Mr. Kerr, you know, we hear you loud and clear and um, on this issue in particular, and I have not been involved in it as um, Representative Norton has or Representative Lane or Albright. There's a subset of members who have come together to work on this issue and it's really been a dogged one uh, for the legislature. So you can imagine um, the struggles that families have as they are separating and the intensity of that that has come to the legislature year after year. And this group of legislators have worked hard to work it through. And so I just wanted to say, I, I'm really glad that you came to testify and to tell your story and to say thanks to Representative Norton and to Representative Lane and others <coughs> and to the testifier. Ms. Summerfield, is that right? Yes, um, For um, your persistence in this because it is affecting people all over the state of Minnesota and to Representative Norton, Here's this one and that non-emergency medical transportation bill that's two tonight. Those are, that would have been, you know, thorns for this legislature since you and I have both been elected. So nice work. Thank you. Representative Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to say that um, I was on this group with uh, Representative Norton. So what has it been, uh, two and a half years now? Um, it's been an amazing time. And I was on the other side of the original point of view than Representative Norton. Um, so she may have been saying, people are being hurt, let's change this so they're not hurt. And I'm saying, more people will be hurt if you change this abruptly. Um, you know, so we, have to, we had to come to a, a consensus. And we never thought we would be at the point we are today. We never dreamed that we would actually uh, address some of the things we are actually addressing. So it's been amazing. And this one didn't quite work. So the, the, the bill will allow them to basically bring in an economist who can help us adjust our formula to work for us. And that's the key piece. We need to make it work for everybody, not just flip-flop it. So it does take a little more time and it's been going for you know 12 years already. Uh, we can take a little bit more time to make it work well. Representative Lockler. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to all who wade into this. It's a thorny issue, I know, um, and I'm not one of those people who waded into it at all. But I do remember that we, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, we passed a, a provision in our divorce law that allowed for a change in the amount of time that was allocated between parents when that was seen as in the best interest of the child. And it might be a mother who's nursing a child um, would have more time with that child in those years, or it might be in the teenage years where a child is more comfortable with one parent or another for whatever reasons. And um, you know, if we're going to have money totally tied to time, um, then that may have some tension points with that. And I'm hoping that as you reconsider your formulas, you can put in some flexibility so that every hour doesn't make a difference. If someone's required to be in an out-of-town business trip a week more than they did last year, that it doesn't totally change the household budgets of either household. Um, so that there's just a little bit of give there because when you get down to the 0.1%, it makes me a little nervous that we're being a little too precise. Life isn't like that. You can be running late for picking up the kids and all of a sudden you slipped off your, your point one. Um, and so I just think we need to, to make sure that there's a little flex in whatever you do that, seem, that puts some common sense in there. And I suspect you're gonna be working towards that. Um, but I do get nervous when I see these, you know, we're getting down to decimal points. All right. 
I could address that if really briefly. One thing, um, when we did put this together, we did model it after Oregon. And Oregon moved from a system that had a couple of cliffs, creating points of conflict at those cliffs. And they moved to the night per night increase. They also created a wonderful website that is very user friendly for pro se people and, and attorneys to determine what the actual schedule is. And they found that conflict actually dropped drastically. Both the Bar Association told us that, as did uh, officials from their Child Support Enforcement Division with the state, because um, it stopped people from fighting over a couple of nights, because the change between the levels is so minuscule that people actually focus a little bit more people who will have conflict over the finances of parenting time and custody will focus a little bit more on a schedule that is in the best interest of their children than one that is in a financial interest for them, a benefit to them. So it, it has helped in other states. It, All right, Representative Norton, any concluding remarks? Uh, no, other than um, I would very much appreciate your support and moving ahead with this. We uh, appreciate that. Appreciate all the work uh, that went into the bill. And sorry that uh, wasn't able to move along further. I know how mm -hmm. frustrating that is, but it's also a very complicated, thorny issue. Uh, and you'll want to make sure that you get it right. Appreciate that. Also appreciate the $12,000 bill. That is our least expensive bill we've seen thus far. Woo! We do appreciate that. Uh, so with that, I will renew my motion that House File 512 be laid over for possible inclusion in our omnibus finance bill. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opponents say aye. Motion prevails 512 is laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you. Representative Pearson is ready to go with House File 1637. Welcome to the committee. Representative Pearson, would you like to move your bill? I would, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move uh, House File 1637 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Service Omnibus Bill. All right. We have the bill before us. Representative Pearson, I don't see any amendments, so to your bill. Uh, yes, um, sorry, excuse me. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to present House File 1637. This bill establishes a supplementary group residential housing rate for the Silver Creek Corner Supportive Housing Unit in Rochester to bridge a funding gap for the facility operations. Silver Creek Cor Corner provides supportive housing to late stage chronic alcoholics and provides round the clock staffing and support. The facility opened in December of 2011 and has documented success in reducing costs associated with public intoxication, including an overall reduction in detox admissions, jail stays, inappropriate emergency room usage, and abusive use of the judicial system. This bill will bring the group residential housing rate for the Silver Creek Corner facility in Rochester in line with uh, other facilities that, um, that uh, Center City Housing currently um, provides in cities like Duluth and St. Cloud. Um, I have with me Rick Klun uh, from Center City Housing who can provide more information about the Rochester facility and the benefits it provides to the local community. Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative um, Pearson. And to the testifier, go ahead and state your name for the record and proceed. My name is Rick Klun, and I'm the executive director at Center City Housing in, with our administrative offices in Duluth, Minnesota. Good evening, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you for allowing me to talk about House File 1637 and our program called Silver Creek Corner in Rochester. My name, as I said, was Rick, is Rick Klun, and I'm the executive director of Center City Housing Corp., a not-for-profit affordable housing developer, owner, and management organization. Center City was incorporated in 1986 and has operated continuously in Minnesota for nearly 30 years. Our, our administrative office and a number of our housing developments are in Duluth, but we also have buildings and programs in St. Cloud, Rochester, with plans for others in Bemidji and Dakota County. In all, we presently have about 650 apartment units and programs for young adults, families, and single adults. Again, this evening, I'm here to ask for your support for House File 1637, which, if approved, will provide a modest amount of financial support for our permanent supportive housing project for chronic public inebriates 
in Rochester. Silver Creek Corner is 40 units of housing for single adult men and women who have histories of long-term homelessness in addition to chemical dependency, primarily alcoholism, uh, addiction. All of our residents at Silver Creek Corner have lived many years on the streets and have countless failed attempts at treatment and sobriety. Many have spent hundreds of days in detox as well. The program in Rochester was modeled after our new San Marco apartments in Duluth and Rivercrest apartments in St. Cloud, which have operated successfully since 2007 and 2010 respectively. Silver Creek Corner opened in 2011. We are not a treatment program, but a housing program, which is now considered an evidence-based practice and is successfully being replicated across our nation. We offer services like counseling and nursing on a voluntary, not mandatory basis, as well as daily sober activities and assistance with medical and social service appointments. Our request from the legislature is to get a rate adjustment that will level our funding in Rochester with those in Duluth and St. Cloud. Parenthetically, in 2007, we, became, we came to the legislature and they approved a funding increase for both Duluth and St. Cloud of about $200 per resident per month, which has enabled us to operate effectively in those locations. Again, simply, we are, we are asking for the same rate increase for Rochester. The net cost for 40 people for a year is about $104,000. Before ending, I would like to share some brief accomplishments of these programs, and they are consistent across all three programs. <clears throat> Use of detox programs in all three communities for these residents has diminished by about 90%. Likewise, police contacts and judicial contacts are down about 85%. Over 50% of our residents have su been successfully housed over three years. While alcohol consumption has not been eliminated, in most cases, residents have dramatically reduced their volume of use and have completely eliminated drinking the most dangerous types of alcohol, aftershave, mouthwash, and cleaning supplies. In all three com communities, our residents no longer utilize expensive emergency rooms as housing. They use ERs only for appropriate medical emergencies like anybody else. HIPAA regulations make it difficult to monetize these savings, but in each community, the hospital systems are great supporters of our programs. I could go on and on, but I'll end with a true story overheard at Silver Creek. Two summers ago, we had a festival for our residents. It included a barbecue and model rocket building and uh, a, model, a model rocket building contest and launch. During the rocket launch, one of my coworkers overheard two of the residents talking. The first said to his buddy, how many times in your life have people worked this hard or cared enough about you to do something like this? The second one said, I can count it on both hands, never. Thank you for your consideration and your time. I would gladly answer any questions that you have. Um, Mr. Klong, could you just uh, inform the body of why your facility in Rochester was left out from the rate increases from the other two locations? We weren't open at that time. Okay, thank you. Um, members, is there, or I should say, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify for or against this bill? All right, seeing none, I will move to Representative Loeffler. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And Mr. Cohn, I, maybe I didn't pick it up in the testimony, but for the extra $104,000 a year, are you, going to, are you adding, planning on adding services or, or um, changing the program in any way? Chairman, Re Representative Loeffler, um, we have been supplementing out of our savings for the last two years to keep the pro program running at the, the level that it, it is running at right now, and we can't continue to do that. If, if we wouldn't get support, we're, we're going to have to make some significant um, cuts in the services that we're providing. And thank you, Mr. Cohn. It's, and is this, this was a new facility in 2011. Did you construct a new facility? Yes. And so um, you based it on, on the old rate structure, but you'd like to be brought up to that of other communities. Uh, you know, Mr. Kwan. I'm sorry. Mr. Kwan, go ahead. Um, Representative Loeffler, Chair, Chairwoman, again, um, when we opened the facility in 2011, we had uh, about $200,000 of DHS money that allowed us to develop the program at the level we did. That money we knew 
might be coming to an end. We, we were able to garner that money for 18 months and then that, that um, money went away. Um, we are able to, we were able to garner and keep that money at, at the other programs. Thank you. Um, Mr. Clon, I do have a question. Uh, when you said uh, if, if the legislature was unable to uh, give you the rate increase, uh, services would be cut. Could you give the body an idea of exactly what kind of services may be cut? I sure can. Um, we have a, a staffing pattern that includes having a minimum of two staff people in the building all the time. That's why we are so successful and we'd have to look at reducing. That's part of the staffing pattern. We have uh, staff members that, again, make appointments for our residents and help them get to appointments, whether it's a doctor or social services or someplace else. Um, we would have to um, look at reducing that dramatically. Um, we have nursing services in the building 20, about 20 hours a week, and we would look at cutting that back to about 10 hours a week, and that would um, reduce the quality of care to our people. And I guess those are just three very real examples. Thank you, Mr. Klon. Is there any other members that uh, wish to ask any questions? Uh, Representative Loeffler. Uh, Liebling, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Madam Chair. And I, I just thought I should say something. I'm the other signature on the bill, and Representative Pearson and I visited the facility together, and um, I'm a great supporter of the bill as well, and I appreciate the fact that he filed it and was willing to bring it because I think one of the things that um, uh, we have to realize is that this is a, a model of care that has huge repercussions throughout the whole community. And um, I know the testifier mentioned this a little bit, but I mean, we really heard that this, um, you know, not only does this give um, essentially treatment, although it isn't a treatment program, but it is a way of dealing with a very um, seriously ill group of people who, for whom nothing has worked. And we, as a state, and, and our county and all the counties spend a tremendous amount of money on this group of people when they're on the street. And not only that, but it's a quality of life issue for the whole community. So when we've got these kinds of facilities and these services, I was looking at the fiscal note and it, look, it says it brings it up to $700 per person per month. You can hardly even rent, I don't know if you can rent a room in Rochester for that right now. I mean, you could get some, you could get housing for that, but it would not be great housing. And this is not just housing. This is housing with, with services, with support, and just saves an enormous amount of money. And I, I think it's a model that is really showing promise. And what you're seeing here is that the model started in, I think, in Duluth, right? And it's spreading. And I think I carried the bill or was involved with the original legislation to start it in Rochester. And there was a lot of skepticism about it. So it's a model that's really proving itself. And I think that's what we're seeing. And hopefully it'll spread to other places as well. Because this committee knows very well how serious the problem of addiction is. And it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Some people cannot, you can't send them to treatment and say, get sober and then we'll give you housing. It just doesn't work that way for them. For them, it's get housing and then you can work on getting sober. And that, that's the way this is working. So I thank the testifier and Representative Pearson for being here with this bill. Thank Ma you. Um, Madam Chairwoman, if I can Lively. just... Uh, Mr. Kahn. One, one comment in response. Just to clarify, uh, the $700 a month is for services, and um, that's the rate two of the rate one and rate two GRH. There's a room and board uh, component also, and that we're not asking for any change. Oh, and then one, one or two editorial comments. Um, my coworkers, um, one of my coworkers who made the presentation on the Senate side is not here uh, today because she's on her way to Colorado because they're asking to model after our program. And we've, um, we've got the governor's um, uh, uh, department head in terms of ending homelessness who's 100% supportive of what we're doing uh, there. And then two weeks ago, there was an article in the, um, in the um, in, the New, in New York, and it came out in the Huffington Post. Um, it says that in New York, it costs forty thousand dollars a year to home, house a homeless person, and the Housing First programs, like we're operating, cost about eighteen thousand, and it's a, a one hundred percent better quality of life than 
living on the streets. All right, Mr. Clunt, we do have a question from Representative McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative uh, Pearson, uh, in the uh, department summary, it says that uh, the increase will be $700 a month, but allows for any legislative, <coughs> God bless you, authorized inflationary adjustments. So I presume then that the legislature will authorize that, but at what point? Mr. Clunt. Well, or, sorry, Representative Pearson. Well, I appreciate the question, uh, Representative McDonald. I would anticipate that that would come at a point when there would be an increase in the costs incurred by um, the, the facilities that, that are being managed and, and uh, where they're needing to have that type of an adjustment down the road where they would make that request. Representative McDonald. Madam Chair, thank you, Representative Pearson. Maybe for uh, Mr. Chung, not Mr. Klung, but Mr. Chung. Uh, <laughs> Is, uh, would that be, uh, does that keep up with the inflationary of uh, two to three percent annually, or is that something that the legislature has to approve each biennium? Um, and I do believe that we do have DHF staff here too that can talk if they wanted to. <laughs> uh, good evening. I'm Jane Lorenz with the Department of Human Services. I'm the manager of the unit that oversees group residential housing. Um, I believe uh, the answer to your question is sometimes there has been some in, uh, increases allowed to the group residential housing program. Uh, generally every year there's an increase um, to the room and board rate and sometimes there is to the su uh, supplementary service rate. Representative McDonald. Uh, is there someone on staff that could answer that? Uh... Uh, Mr. Berg. Madam Chair, Representative McDonald, just following on the testifier's comments, I mean, it says that this would allow for any legislatively authorized inflationary adjustments. So it would be at the discretion of the legislature when it chose to uh, increase those rates as was described. There isn't a regular schedule in statute or contemplated by the bill, it simply allows for an increase to this set of rates if the legislature chooses to add an inflationary rate. Mr. Madam Chair, Mr. Mr. Burke, McCall. thank you. That's exactly what I was uh, anticipating or thought that, that my question would be answered. So thank you. Oh, uh, Representative Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. A question about the how that supplementary service rate is determined. So I know there's other uh, service providers throughout the state that, well, there's probably not that many, but there are that, that spe with the specialized population. I know of like one in the, the Senate district that I uh, represent. So, so this would add, so if you could clarify what that service rate is currently, how that's figured out, um, is that across the board? And so then we're just giving, we're, this bill is asking to give an increase to just one, or does everybody get that's providing these types of services? Um, Madam Chairman, Chairwoman, and excuse me, and members of the committee, um, it's my understanding that this service rate is was requested by Center City, and it's specific to the facility in Rochester. Um, there are several different exception rates for lots of different facilities across the state of Minnesota, and they have all been determined individually per setting. Representative Allen? Okay. All right, uh, do we have any other questions? All right, seeing none. Uh, Representative Pearson, any closing comments? Uh, you know, I, other than my, the great comments that were made by Representative Liebling and, and the test fire, um, I would just share also uh, for my support of this bill, uh, a lot of it stems from speaking with a member of law enforcement when we were having that tour and, uh, you know, the understanding of chronic alcoholism and, and what that meant to him in, in his daily uh, routine and, and law enforcement in general in Olmsted County and in, in Rochester. And um, he was, when uh, he spoke with us that day, he was one of the biggest uh, opponents of this idea and concept. And uh, his 
eyes having been opened and, and understanding what it means and how these people are able to live within our community, participate in our community in a, uh, in a safe manner, in a uh, safe manner for them, safe manner for the community, and, uh, and, and all of the, uh, the humanity that goes with that uh, were, were really spoke a lot to me. So I would encourage you to support uh, this bill, and I would like to renew my motion um, to have House File 1637 laid over for possible inclusion in the Human Services, uh, Health and Human Services Omnibus Bill. All right, Representative Pearson renews his motion that House File 1637 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Bill. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Motion prevails, and 16, House File 1637 is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Bill. All right, Representative Pearson, I believe you have another bill up. Yes, I'd like to move House File 1639 be laid over for possible inclusion in the uh, Health and Human Service Omnibus Bill. Representative Pearson moves House File 1639 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Bill. We have the bill before us. Representative Pearson, to your bill. Yes, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. And House File 1639 provides funding uh, to continue a medical legal partnership between hospitals, clinics, nursing homes, and legal service organizations. Uh, in 2013 through 2014, through a competitive grant process, Legal Aid was awarded a funding to provide legal services to patients who receive inpatient and outpatient hospital services paid for by emergency medical assistance programs. Uh, the main goal of this grant is to save money in an uncompensated care for our hospitals and nursing homes. Under this grant so far, services have been provided to more than 100 clients in over 15, or excuse me, in 15 counties throughout Minnesota. Last biennium, the legislature appropriated $200,000 for this program, and we're currently asking for an increase of $50,000 per year for a funding total of request of $300,000. Um, I've not heard any opposition to this bill, and today with me I have a Betsy Perel. Perel. Perel, excuse me. I, I knew it was like the lotion, right? oh, <laughs> kind of like that. But anyway, any, an attorney with uh, legal aid who is here to provide some brief testimony, uh, if, if you're willing, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Pearson, and absolutely I'm willing. Um, Ms. Perel, if you will state your name uh, for the record and proceed. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Betsy Perel. I'm a staff attorney at Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid. MMLA is the current grantee of the EMA referral project. I'd like to share an example of how the grant has helped Minnesota residents and care providers alike. The cases of Mr. Z. Mr. Z and Asylee entered a nursing home from the hospital following a stroke. While in the nursing home, Mr. Z's medical assistance ended when a routine recertification was not completely com completed correctly. Nursing home staff mistakenly believed Mr. Z was eligible only for emergency medical assistance because he did not have a current document verifying his asylum status. After his EMA care plan was denied, we were able to get his proper classification verified and the nursing home was paid for seven months of care for which it had not been compensated. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I welcome questions. All right, thank you, Ms. Perel. Um, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify on this bill? All right, is there any questions from the members? Representative Loeffler. Liebling. I'm so sorry, you guys can't sit next to each other. <laughs> they put us here. <laughs> Yeah, right here. It's in Mary's old place. Madam Chair. Um, Representative so, Loft, or Liebling. Liebling. <laughs> 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 of, uh, well used to do the same thing. <laughs> You're trying to get me to forget my question, I know. All right, so, um, so now what was the question? <laughs> Genius. Jeez, Mary, um, you're smart. Okay, so the question was, in the situation that um, the testifier spoke about, the nursing home is being saved many, many thousands of dollars. Does the nursing home uh, 
have any financial responsibility or help with the cost of the um, the service that was provided that saved them the many thousands of dollars. Uh, Representative Pearson. Well, I'll, I'll have my testifier speak to that. But you know, I, I first of all would say that the uh, the nursing home would probably just not even know where to begin uh, or know where to start, and so they almost need someone to go to to provide quality legal services. And, and I guess I would ask my uh, Ms. Perel uh, to address that also. All right, Ms. Perel. Madam Chair, uh, Representative, I. I, I, the you know people we're serving are these individuals who are have the health care needs and I'm not sure if I'm fully understanding your question in terms of if the nursing home pays for the services that like an office like ours is providing well representative uh, Liebling. Liebling. thank you, you <laughs> I guess I mean I'm I I understand the bill I heard it in a previous committee and you know I I don't have any objection to the bill but I'm just thinking that um, maybe there ought to be a way when when um, services provided um, legal services are provided and okay the person who's in the in the facility or getting the care is probably going to get the care anyway in many cases and the the real entity that's really being benefited by um, clarifying the person's eligibility for some kind of funding is the provider of the health care services right and I'm just wondering um, whether there wouldn't be some way to um, have the the health care provider contribute toward those services because that's really who the beneficiary is I guess that's what I'm suggesting because um, I would guess that in some hospitals some some large providers that they might actually provide legal staff to try to work with people to make sure that they in fact I'm sure that happens that uh, legal staff work with people to make sure that they are you know they get whatever they're eligible for because then it prevents that provider from having to absorb uncompensated care. So that's, that's all. That's my question. It's probably a little bit outside the scope of the bill, but the bill is attempting to provide, provide those services without cost to the person who, in many cases, may ultimately be saving lots and lots of money as a result of those services. That's all. I just thought maybe it'd be, be nice to see if some of that could be recaptured from all that money that's being saved. And that is a great point, Representative Liebling. Ms. Perel, do you have anything to add to that? Madam Chair, Representative, I think it's a, a bit outside the scope of my own expertise, unfortunately. There may be others here who may be able to address that. I don't know if anyone would like to, but I'm sorry, I can't say further. Okay. Madam Chair, I, you know, I, I think a point well taken, uh, Representative Liebling, and, and certainly, you know, uh, understanding the the depth and breadth and scope of of the number of facilities that this potentially uh, touches for a you know a fiscal note of, of three hundred thousand dollars in a biennium um, it, it obviously is, is spread thin so I, I think in many ways uh, you, you know what you're contemplating there is an idea to to use you know some of that recaptured value there to maybe continue to fund or, or provide this service further and that's that's something that could be contemplated in the future remembering that this is just a uh, an appropriation one time once again a renewed appropriation from two hundred thousand in the past to three hundred thousand um, this this biennium so uh, something that could be looked at and reviewed for future consideration I think okay thank you uh, representative Pearson is there anyone else that has anything to say or to add no seeing none all right uh, representative Pearson do you have any closing comments uh, you know I uh, just would ask for your support I, I think it's a, a great piece of, of legislation that uh, great program that that someone thought of before me and and I'm just happy to uh, continue to move it forward and I'd like to renew my motion to uh, have house file uh, 1639 have it laid over for possible inclusion in the House uh, Health and Human Service omnibus bill. All right, Representative Pearson renews his motion that House File 1639 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS omnibus bill. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. 
Motion prevails, and House File 1639 is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS omnibus bill. And next up, we have Representative Zerwas. He's making his way. Okay. So Representative Zerwas moves House File 161 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS omnibus bill. We have the bill for, before us, and there is an author's amendment titled A15-0401. And Representative Zerwas moves the amendment A15-0401. Representative Zerwas, do you have everything you need? Um. Uh-oh, don't ask that question. Okay, yeah. do the amendment. <laughs> oh. Well, he looks Vote. Like he's lost. <laughs> yes, all in favor. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, all those opposed, say aye. It's a technical amendment from the advisor. I didn't bring out my folder. I brought out my folder for the other bill today. I'm going blind. All right. I get crazy. Don't so, cry. um... Is this sixty one right here? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want it? No. Nah. Okay. <laughs> he knows it by heart. So all those in favor to Representative Zerwas's amendment say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. No. <laughs> Motion prevails. <laughs> Representative Zerwas to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh House Bill one sixty one is the the ABLE Act uh, to help set up um, savings accounts. Um, for uh, families with children with uh, disabilities. And so um, modeled after a, a college savings plan or a 529, uh, this would allow individuals uh, and families to contribute money um, over the course of the uh, child's life um, to pay for, um, I think there's four categories of, of uh, housing, education, uh, health costs, um, and so that's that's kind of the gist of the bill. Um, in the finance committee here, um, we received an updated fiscal note today, which is a a little bit concerning. And I've uh, spoken with the department. And we're going to continue uh, to work with the department uh, to try to bring down the the expenses around that fiscal note. Um, in one line of the bill, I think it's line 3.15. Uh, it, we, we call on uh, the bill uh, to provide um, marketing uh, uh, for the plan administration. And um, there's been a pretty significant cost uh, assigned to that, which um, clearly we were, we're going to try to avoid. Um, and so we're going to continue to work uh, with the department and try to mitigate uh, those costs as far as implementation. In the governor's budget, he has around $100,000 uh, for this program. And so that's certainly um, not in line uh, with the fiscal note either. Um, and so as we move forward, um, we're going to continue to revise um, what uh, what goes into that fiscal note. Um, if, you, if you read into the details of the narrative of the fiscal note, they said they worked with the Office of Higher Education. It's not what they were doing to promote the college saving plans. Well, clearly this is going to be um, a much different um, and much smaller uh, group that you would be targeting. Um, there would be nonprofits helping with this work. Um, we're also uh, informed that there's going to be a federal uh, component because this is state enactment language of a federal law. So there's going to be a federal push um, to, to get information out about uh, this program. So I'm thinking that this is a cost that we can really drive down um, to help this be more doable this year. Well, thank you, Representative Zerwas. Um, I understand you do have a testifier, Steve Larson. Madam Chair, I'm Steve Larson with the ARC Minnesota, and I testified on behalf of this bill in the policy or the reform committee. And I'm just here to help answer any questions if any arise. And I think uh, Representative Zerwas has a thorough understanding of the bill, and uh, just having seen the fiscal note today, too, uh, we do have those concerns, too, about the uh, marketing component of it. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify on this bill? Seeing none, are there any questions from members? 
That one. Representative Loeffler. No, oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, um, well, Madam Chair. name right. You did. Thank you. <laughs> and um, Representative Zerwester, Mr. Nelson, I mean, I like the idea of these. The problem is that the federal regulations have not been promulgated. They may not be out for another year, as I understand it. And, um, and it's hard to really understand how these accounts will intertwine with our current system, since many of the things that you can use it for, like transportation and housing, are things that we often pick up in our medical assistance or other budgets. And can, can we get a better feel for how you see this evolving, at least? Uh, Mr. Larson. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative uh, Loeffler. Uh, Madam Chair, you have uh, Representative Schumacher's uh, sign in front yep. of you. So I know. I, I'm sorry. I don't want to accidentally call you it's by fine. the wrong name. <laughs> <laughs> I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> the federal government has encouraged states to go ahead with the authorizing legislation. And in fact, they just came out with a statement on, on along that line in the past uh, couple of weeks. And I think there is clarity in the federal bill, and I think uh, further uh, clarity or that uh, corresponds with that in the uh, state authorizing legislation here as far as uh, how this interacts with uh, uh, medical assistance programs and other public, uh, publicly funded programs. So I don't believe that that is an issue and we haven't heard any of those issues uh, brought up by the Department of Human Services staff or others uh, in regards to that. But that's something we will definitely uh, pay attention to. It's very important uh, that, that that be very clear both uh, to uh, the administrators of the program, as well as uh, the recipient or the <coughs> individuals with disabilities, all be investing in the Able Act. Um, Representative Loeffler. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. And I just think we're—it's a new thing, and we're all just trying to figure out how does it supplement, and in what ways does it do it. Um, the other thing that I have a concern about, and we didn't hear this in the tax committee, where we usually get. We have all these experts who understand all the ins and outs of 529 accounts, and that's what this is modeled off of. Um, but I'm wondering whether or not uh, lines 8.4 to 8.6 are really actually going to work very effectively, um, which is upon the death of a beneficiary, the amount remaining um, must be distributed. And as I recall, um, under 529 programs, um, you can transfer it to another family member with the same needs. Um, so that um, if you were going to put money into, say, two children's accounts and one of them decides not to go to college, you can transfer it to your other child to use for college expenses, but you can't transfer it to that child to buy their first home or, you know, something that isn't related. And, and it's, well, it's not unusual for a family to have two children um, with disabilities. It's, you know, thankfully not the norm. And um, I'm wondering whether or not this limitation would actually create some, some challenges um, that we need to yet address. Mr. Larson. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Loeffler, uh, the owners of the uh, ABLE accounts will be the individuals with disabilities themselves. And so although children can invest in it, it will be a lot of adults too. But we can look into that further and get that information uh, back to you. I think, I think there's starting to be some clarifying language come out. Uh, that is starting to come out and the federal government had a six-month timeline to get this out and there seems to be a lot of interest and urgency to do that and that would be in June so hopefully we'll have some of those answers but that that's an uh, excellent point and yeah. madam chair uh, yes Representative madam chair members and just so perhaps a little bit of clarity too is this is while well, modeled after a 529 this this is quite a bit different because the money um, going in there um, isn't a pre-tax or, you know, it isn't um, a, a tax avoidance or tax deferral. It, it still, it doesn't change your, your, mm -hmm. your gross tax amount, I guess is, is what I'm saying. So your gross income and so, um, or your taxable income it would be. And so I think the idea of the 529 college savings plans being built up huge and huge and huge because you're lowering your taxable income and then you have a child or two that decides not to use that and then there's a little bit more of how to get the money um, out of there per se. This is a little bit uh, different uh, than that in that it's money being put in um, for the individual and then for the adult um, to continue with 
life expectancy, uh, with life uh, expenses. And I think one of the big advantages um, of having that, that savings account um, accrued um, for individuals that would, that would benefit from this is it, it gives a family um, an opportunity um, to set up that, that cushion or that savings um, for a young adult that will have um, significantly high uh, potentially uh, expenses and that money that's that's there in that able account will not count against them um, in qualifying for um, social security disability and and things like that so I think that's the main benefit versus um, a 529 plan while well, you have some college tuition benefits you also have um, an income tax benefit the income tax benefit doesn't exist uh, in this program all right thank you Okay. Thank you. Uh, Representative Dean. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Zerwas. The fiscal note on this that I was just asking you about a little bit before uh, seems a little odd um, to come back and a little bumpy. Is there, if we can iron that out, is there any other costs in the bill that we have to address or is that pretty much it? Uh, Madam Chair, members, Chair Dean, my understanding is the significant portion is the is the marketing uh, aspect of it that we'll be looking at the the other components of the fiscal note involve uh, a full-time one FTE to uh, implement the third-party contracting component of that but I think after 12 or 18 months that position is then paid for out of the fees generated uh, the, the administration fees the plan fees um, of the account and so I think the big hurdle um, that we're seeing is that marketing piece and um, I think um, I think it's been mentioned before that there's going to be a, um, a pretty significant federal push uh, to advertise uh, the option and then you know specific nonprofits um, health care providers that deal uh, with with parents or or individuals with with uh, long-term disabilities will obviously have this as an option for their clientele and so I think it's, it's not like saving for college where you're going to put a billboard on on I-94 and 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 advertise putting away money for your kids college this is going to be much more directed and specific so I think in the in the physical note they've they've modeled modeled it after the office of higher education's 529 advertisement plan I think realistically we're going to see something uh, much smaller in, in scale. Thank you, uh, Representative Zerwas, and uh, this is a great bill, and I, ho I hope we're able to move this thing forward and to iron out some of the costs uh, so that we can do that, and also would encourage uh, you and Mr. Larson and the advocates to try to, um, if there's a way to allow the maximum amount of flexibility for parents and grandparents to contribute. Uh, so that we can eliminate any roadblocks uh, to contributions and also to common sense uses for the for the money. I know parents with disabled kids are usually, uh, if they don't have a lot of common sense to start with, they have to develop it in order to kind of uh, make her from day to day. So there's a lot of practicality involved with that, and we just want to make sure that we uh, allow for maximum flexibility for both parents um, and other p grandparents and family members to contribute uh, for both to receive funds and to expend them from the account. So thanks, Mr. Larson and Representative Zerwas for the bill. Yes, Madam, great points. Uh, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Representative Zerwas. Yeah, just briefly on the kind of the basics of the account, it, it would be open for uh, for investments from family members. Again, there's not the, the tax implications, so they're not as, as, as drilled down as to who can put money in. There's a maximum cap, or there's a maximum invest annual investment of fourteen thousand dollars that's allowed, and there's a maximum cap of a hundred thousand dollars for how big the account can get. So it can't get to be something that where it could never be spent down. And um, whether you're talking about someone that has um, a, a, a significant disability, you're talking about medical expenses or housing expenses, um, or, and some education or continuing ed expenses. You look at a hundred thousand dollar cap and that can go pretty quickly um, as as well all right representatives are um is there anyone else that has any questions uh, yes representative McDonald thank you madam chair uh, representative Zerwas so regarding the um, 
Your commissioner, that's just going to administration. I see that there may be, they may impose a fine or a fee rather is what it states in the bill. But then they also have the authority to do, uh, to go to a third party for investments, which they too then can impose fees, which to your bill says, you know, keep it to the lowest possible fee, of course. But um, so would that be then a double fee for this investment? So you'd have an administration fee and then also then a third party would be able to administer and invest the funds and they can impose a fee. Representative Zerwas. I'm, I may have to phone a friend on this one, Madam Chair. Okay. There is someone with the department here and I'm wondering if they would know if there's a double fee or. Madam Chair, members, um, I, my understanding is that the, the fee that the commissioner would, uh, would impose would be to pay the contract for that third party, um, but I'm not sh so I think that would cover that fee, but that's something that we will look into and make sure that we have info uh, on as we move forward. All right, thank you. Madam Chair. Uh, Representative McDonald. Yeah, just to follow up, thank you. Yeah, so then in subdiv uh, subdivision five on the administration, and then on uh, what's the other page, um, uh, subsection two then, permitted investments and contracting authority. So that area you can look at. You can get back to me on that, Representative Zerwas, that's fine. But I think it's something to look into. Uh, it's an investment by these folks and family members. You want to make sure that uh, uh, both the administration and the commissioner and third parties aren't imposing all kinds of fees that really would be, I would, under your bill, it presume, presumably is a small fee, but they do add up. Representative Zerwas. Madam Chair, members, um, just had some information from uh, the department. Line 5.17, subdivision 6, the authority to impose fees, you know, the commissioner may impose annual fees. As So we believe that is the only uh, portion that would uh, have fees on to the consumer, but that's something that, Representative McDonald, um, I certainly will check into and, and look over because you're 100% right. The last we want to do is is take something that should be an absolute benefit to families in Minnesota and, and make it less of that. Um, and so that's something that we will look into and, uh, and address if need be. All right. And then Madam Chair. Representative McDonald. Uh, then lastly, uh, Represent Representative Zerwas, regarding line 6.24, authority of the account. So it says an account owner is the only person entitled to uh, request distributions or have a rollover. So. Uh, I think that it might uh, benefit us just to look at that a little carefully uh, as to some people could take advantage of those who have disabilities, uh, unfortunately. And if it's only that person that can um, request distributions of those funds and not their caretaker or family member, that could be a potential or do you see it as a potential as being a sticky area? Representative Sir West. And Madam Chair and members, and I, I think the I think the potential is mitigated by how tightly controlled the, the um, categories for distribution are. Housing, um, continuing education, health care expenses. Um, and so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible to take a distribution in cash and give it to a friend, for example. Um, the distributions would be tightly controlled um, for those uh, categories. <coughs> Okay, Representative Sir West, I do believe that Representative Grunhagen has a question. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Sir West, for bringing this bill forward. But I don't work in this area that much, but I'm a little bit familiar with it uh, as far as on the investment side. But to me, a 529, the mutual fund companies, if you put a mutual fund, take care of the administration of the 529. And they do charge a fee for it in most cases. I mean, to me, all the bill has to do is uh, excluded from uh, 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 the money from being used in terms of the qualifications for certain state benefits. And number two, if you want to modify above existing law, what people can pull the money out for. I mean, I, I just don't see why the commissioner, this, and it's an initial thought for you to check out, Mm. is I don't know why the commissioner and all this other stuff is involved in this. Because uh, all you got to do is, uh, and maybe your testifier can respond to that, but all you have to do is uh, protect, you know, the bill just has to say don't use the money for qualification of public programs 
and here's, you know, you could draw the money out for these reasons, which is compliance with federal law, if you want to make some other exception. Uh, I, I just don't see why all the rest of the stuff is involved in this. If it's if just donations from relatives or friends or whatever, I wish I had a friend like that, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the um, anyway, just some thoughts for you to consider, and uh, you don't really have to respond unless you have a, a short response. But it's just my thoughts. Uh, Representative Zerwasi did say short. So. Wow. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, Representative Loeffler has a question. Oh. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and I just want to say that. This is an, a wonderful opportunity that we don't totally understand yet in terms of how you could use the resources for the benefit of someone having a better life than what we provide under our current publicly funded programs. At the same time, it's going to increase the inequities potentially in our system because right now, if you don't have a family that could contribute to this, um, if you did, you could get up to $100,000 of resources for special things in your life. Um, but if you didn't, you're going to have to spend down to what Representative Zeros is also trying to fix, um, to the $3,000, which doesn't give you enough to do really anything in your life. Um, and so I think we're going to, as this evolves, have to really sort of um, say we're going to make sure that we as a, a state are making sure that opportunities are available to everybody and, and really address that spend down. Um, effort at the same time we're looking at creating some new opportunities for other people because um, the inequities will continue to grow if we don't and um, they'll become crueler as we go along particularly since it might give some people an excuse to say well we don't really need to put that much in that MA because they've all got those 529 programs and there won't be everybody who has those and so we're gonna have to figure that out as this evolves because it will it will change um, what we've got to work with and what families and individuals have to work with. All right, Representative Zerwas. Madam Chair, members, Representative Loeffler, I, you know where I'm at on the, on the MA spend down and, and where my priorities are, are there. And I think it, it, it comes back perhaps to a, to a, to a worldview or a, or a life philosophy in that I want to help every single person that is in Minnesota that's struggling with a disability um, live as comfortable as a life as they possibly can. And this is another program that can help um, some Minnesotans and, and, and some families. Um, will it help everyone? A absolutely not. Um, but I think when uh, Senator Klobuchar pushed this through the Senate, I think she, she was on the right track. And, and so she was one of the main sponsors and the Senate, she gave her, her press conference and, and, and touted this program. Um, I don't think when she worked on it in D.C., she thought this was going to help every disabled individual in the United States, but she knew it would make a difference in some people's lives. And so that's what I'm trying to do uh, with this bill. Um, I think it will help some individuals' lives. Um, I don't have a silver bullet for, for MA or MA spend down. I think it would be a lot more popular if I did, but, uh, but I think this is a, a step forward that's going to help a lot of families in Minnesota. All right, thank you, uh, Representative Zerwas. Seeing no other questions, um, Representative Zerwas, do you have any closing comments? Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, thank you so much for hearing the bill tonight. I'm sorry I went a little longer than I thought, and um, I hope we get the um, I hope we get the fiscal concerns addressed um, so that this is something that can be uh, included in the final bill. And with that, I'll renew my motion. All right, Representative Zerwas renews his motion that House File 161, as amendment, amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS omnibus bill. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. No. Motion prevails, and House File 161 as amendment is amended is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS omnibus bill. Now, members, before you rush out of here to hit the hay or whatever we call it these days, um, tomorrow there, I have a big announcement for you guys. Tomorrow, <laughs> yeah. tomorrow, HHS Finance will meet at the regular time Good. at the call of the, and at the call of the chair, which is around 6:15. I know you're all excited about that. Um, Ooh. 
Amendments um, deadline for the added bills is 2 p.m. And all newly added bills will be heard in the evening. Amendments and documents submitted to the committee are posted to the committee page. So I won't ask for roll call on that because I know everybody's just excited to say aye. And uh, with that, the meeting is adjourned.